Hey guys, how's it going? It's Thang and welcome to this video. So today we're going to be talking about the wonderful colors of our succulents, why they happen and how to achieve them. As you've already seen my Instagram and maybe other people's, but my Instagram, you've seen uh, them on my Instagram, Facebook, and definitely in my last tour video that I've achieved these wonderful, momentous, beautiful colors in my collection this year. And it is just absolutely stunning, right? Stunning. And you probably like looked it up. How do I get colors? How to stress these things? Yada, 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 right? A lot of people probably give you the same answers. And unfortunately, I've been watching a few of them and a few of them actually got them pretty much wrong in certain areas, certain areas that got right. But um, so we're gonna learn about pigments today, the basic of pigments. And then we'll go about, you know, how to obtain these colors. So let's do that. So. Our main three pigments is going to be, uh, the main one is chlorophyll, not chloroform, guys. Not, chloroform is when, that's chloroform. Chlorophyll is the green pigment within all of our plants in our world. And what it does, is it converts light into energy through a process called photosynthesis. And that's pretty much life for plants, basically it. <laughs> And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, so the next one is carotenoid, which is uh, your reds, orange, and yellows. And it actually does photosynthesis as well, but not as much as chlorophyll, right? So you'll see them in like your oranges, orange oranges, carrots, um, and your lemons, right? Basic, you know, whatever. Uh, so those are there, right? Um, and our last pigment, which is the main one we're looking at, the one that actually causes the changes within all of our beautiful succulents, is actually called anthocyanin. Yes, anthocyanin is responsible for your colors of reds, your colors of purple, pink, and blues. And anthocyanin is actually not present in the plants until it is needed. Hmm, yeah. So anthocyanin is actually not present until extreme temperature or extreme light condition happens for that to, for the plants to produce anthocyanin to protect itself from light and temperature, whether it's hot or cold. Pretty much simple, right? Exactly. Although certain plants actually don't produce anthocyanin, they have other means like farina to protect itself from the sun and the heat. There's so many ways, right? Okay, so now you're probably thinking, Fang, um, if carotenoid uh, isn't responsible for the colors for anthocyanin, why do, why do the succulent change to reds, orange, and yellows uh, in the summer? And most people will tell me it's because it's heat activated. Actually, unfortunately, that's not true. Carotenoid is mainly just pigments you know, pigments to show colors. Um, and it does photosynthesis, but not as much as chlorophyll, right? You see them in, like I said, oranges, carrots, lemons. And a perfect example I wanna show you here is this variegated black prince. You see? So this variegated black prince has chlorophyll, carotenoid, and anthocyanin, all three at the same time. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it all three at the same time. So the color that you see during the summer is caused by anthocyanin. Um, the reds in the summer is caused by anthocyanin. The oranges is caused by anthocyanin. The mixture of the amount of anthocyanin pigments with the chlorophyll pigments can cause orange, right? Pretty much simply it. Uh, so carotenoid is not responsible for pigment changes. Carotenoid is when a plant grows up naturally and it is naturally those colors without the need of extra light or extra temperature. It is just as it is, right? Uh, another example is this one right here. Um, this is a, a sedum nahama sabasaba. Saba. Uh, it changes into orange during the summertime because the leaf itself is actually light green and a mixture of anthocyanin reds changes into orange. Pretty much simple as that. So that's, that's pretty much basic for the pigments. Now, also you have to understand that these pigmentations, uh, especially carotenoid and anth anthocyanin, um, needs to be inherited like us, like us with our genetic makeup, right? Um, like I myself uh, am fair-skinned Asian. 
So think of pigments as our melanin, which is actually pigments, right? Um, I'm born with fair skin, um, but when in the sun, I tan really easy. So I pretty much have, you know, anthocyanin, melanin, whatever. And I tan golden brown really nice easily versus other people where they just burn. So they have to put sunscreen on, right? Um, and there are cultivators around the world where they're hybridizing, you know, constantly having these plants with these plants so that way um, more anthocyanin is more present or more um, carotenoid is present, right? Because we love these luscious colors and the only way we can do that is hybridizing and hoping that a plant, a baby plant is, uh, sorry, a baby plant mutates or carries on these genes from their parents to have these um, pigments. That's pretty much simply it. Easy, easy peasy peasy beer, five cup girl. Okay, so now that we understood the basics of pigments, we can go ahead and do our test, our experiments, and understand what we need for certain people, right? So I myself live in an apartment in Canada where I don't have the luxury of leaving them on my balcony all year long because they're just going to die. Um, so I don't have that luxury. I'm not as fortunate as others where they have a greenhouse or where they live in a, uh, a climate that's pretty much summer all year long or in the Mediterranean where it's summer all year long, right? I'm not as fortunate as, as, as those other people. So we need to adapt to that if we want these beautiful colors right right so a lot of people will tell you to stress them out which is very very true because we have to think back where these plants come from they come from the desert and within the desert you know lots of light extreme heat and very much little to no water at all right so we need to go back to that basic as well so our setup has to kind of emulate that as well so the main three variables, yet again, is going to be light, water, and what's that? Temperature, light, water, and temperature. But mainly light and water is what we need to concentrate in this, right? So our light source has to be the right light source and powerful and a powerful light source as well. Because one, the sun itself is an extremely powerful light source. You know that, we know that. Everybody knows that except for, I don't know, flat earth, I don't know, people. Um, <clears throat> you know, without our sun, our world will turn into an ice plant within months. Like that. No problem at all, right? Um, so unfortunately, even with the most powerful lighting system, it's not going to be as powerful as the sun, right? So we need to get a lighting system that is very, very powerful. Number one. Number two how long of the duration would light need uh, for the plants need for light um, so the sun is powerful uh, with it outside if you leave it outside you can probably much like six to eight hours of sun a day that's pretty much it that's all it needs really right but indoors you have to think differently right to get the plants to produce anthocyanin we have to pump it with a lot of light a lot of stressful light all day long right so I used to do 12 hours which is okay you know it lives whatever then I did 14 hours then it perks up a little bit more and then I went and just went ahead and cranked it up to 18 hours a day yep that magical number of 18 hours is actually the key the key number to um, changing the beautiful greens into the luscious, beautiful colors that it is right now. Yeah, 18 hours of light, indoor lights, is the key number for me. You know, other people might be different because I, I don't pay for hydro, I don't pay for electricity, right? So I'm lucky that way. So that's, that's the one main variable. Second variable, which everybody tells you is stop watering your plants, which is honestly true. They live in the desert, so do that. Water, the water is very, very important. Uh, the watering in between waters is also very, very important as well. I used to water my plants once a week and then twice, uh, sorry, and then once every two weeks. And then I just decided, you know what? Why don't I just water once a month, right? Um, and once I started decreasing the amount of water that it takes, 
the anthocyanin started pumping out even more and I saw more purples, more pinks, more reds, so much easier, so much easily. Yep. And you can actually increase uh, the, the time in between that too. So you can go from one month to two months to three months actually. There is a plant down there that I have that I haven't watered for three months now and it still looks gorgeous, right? You have to stop, wa you have to stop worrying about watering succulents and remember that they live in the desert, right? There are actually a few more beneficial factor for you to not water your plants so very often. Um, especially echeverias, you don't have to water them that often. Other plants you do, yeah, so you have to eye that, but echeverias. So the other benefits of not watering your plants so much is compactness, right? A more compact and chubbier form of the plant, right? So when you, when you, when you see people watering more often, their plants grow bigger, longer and thinner versus what we want is smaller and chubbier, right? So that's the other beneficial factor of not watering so much, right? So it'll grow into a more compact, I'll show you actually right here, a more compact rose lotus type of form, right? Chubbier form as well simply it and actually the last benefit which I find is that the less I water plants the less mealybugs I get which is really weird every single time I water something there seems to even be mealybugs coming out interesting but that's that's my observation though so um, anyways and the last variable is temperature simply throw it out there Lots of light, less water, more heat, more cold, and it just changes colors. So temperature is really not really a huge variable that we need to concern ourselves about. It's the first two, light and water. You need to adjust it accordingly so that way you can get beautiful succulents like this. Oh my God, right? I actually wanna show you some few examples right here. Uh, this is my heart's lily, my heart's lily. You see how beautiful and gorgeous it is? Um, before, you know, this experiment, it used to look like this, which looks fugly, right? It looks so fugly uh, because, well, you know, it's just, now it looks absolutely gorgeous. And then this is my Graptovera Benisi right here, right? In different condition. I'll show you these five pictures. Uh, so the first picture is when I first owned it. Um, and then the first winter, and then the summertime, then the winter this year before this experiment, and right now, which is gorgeously peachy pink, right? So less in the water and more light gives you this beautiful compact and compact looking color, like looking plants. So that is pretty much simply, so th sorry, that's pretty much how colors work within succulents. And I hope that, you know, educates a lot of you out there. And now that you understand more about it and hopefully that you understand to water less of your plants and not to worry about watering your succulents. They can go for months without water, months and months and months and months. Anyways, hopefully you like this video and you've learned something. And if you do a thumbs up, uh, let me know how your experiment goes and don't forget to press subscribe and I'll see you guys later. Love you. Bye.